I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. This is James Altucher here at the James Altucher Show. And the title of today's interview is How to Be a Superhuman. I'm going to be interviewing Stephen Kotler, who wrote the book, The Rise of the Superhuman, and we'll be discussing what he means by a superman. Uh, but uh, first, I want to introduce my co-host, Aaron Brabham. Aaron, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, James. It's good to be here. Uh, you know, you already recorded the interview. I listened to it about an hour ago. I found it pretty fascinating. It's actually one of my favorite interviews that you've done so far, but it's on a subject matter that I'm highly interested in. And I'm sure a lot of our uh, listeners out there will really enjoy it as well. Yeah, I mean, it's basically uh, I mean, the book focuses a lot on the gap between what the brain can train for and what the body and brain will do when it goes beyond what it can train for. So, for instance, he, he focuses a lot on these extreme athletes. Like, let's say you're climbing up a mountain or, or jumping off a mountain with no ropes or anything like that, or you're you're surfing in extreme conditions or you're skateboarding and trying to do something that's never been done before. These are things that the average person can train only so much. But when you're actually in the event, things can happen which have never been, which have never occurred before to you, which you've never trained for. And if you don't act faster than the brain can make a decision, then you're going to die. This is not just like, uh, oh, I've trained for this. I'm either going to succeed or fail. You're either going to live or die if you do something wrong. And a lot of people have died in these extreme sports. So the question Stephen asks is what is happening in the body that makes these people essentially do things that nobody has ever done before and the brain has never even properly trained for before like what sort of fills that gap between the you know the practical and the capable and the basically unbelievable yeah it's a it's definitely a great interview but james before we get to that i just want to take a few minutes um to talk about you know one of your uh write-ups that you did that really garnered a ton of attention and uh, I'm not sure a lot of your listeners may have seen it. They may not have. But it's five ways to do nothing and become more productive. Uh, I've read it before, but I saw it on LinkedIn. And uh, you received over a quarter million views, you know, uh, 1,800 uh, comments on it nearly. I mean, um, is, this, is this something that I think you put it out in several places 
But what's the power behind this do nothing and become more productive, do you think? Well, it's it's interesting. And I'll even say it's it's related to uh, being a Superman, although not quite in the context uh, that Stephen talks about in the book. But, you know, the reality is m- most of the day people are just filled with negative chatter. And this happens to me all the time. Like I'm thinking about someone who made me angry or someone or something I'm paranoid about or something I'm anxious about, or maybe I didn't get enough sleep the night before. Like there's lots of things that factor into negative chatter and just, and this kind of happens as we get older and older and, you know, we build up all these things that we resist. Like we resist our boss, you know, telling us to do something or we resist, you know, some bad thing happening to us or we feel lonely or we feel rejected. And, you know, but a lot of times when we're feeling in this sort of negative state and let's even call it a negative flow state, like everything we do from that state is going to have the reverse consequences of what we want to have happen. So, for instance, if if I'm angry and I send off an email, like let's say someone sent me an email that makes me angry and I send an angry email back, like you better do this or else, like they're never going to do what I say they should do, particularly when I'm angry. So the, the reality is I'll be, you know, what, when I do send those emails, it's like reverse productivity. I've actually just made my life situation worse. Or when I'm paranoid, like, um, you know, why did you leave that phone call for me at 5 p.m. on a Friday. Like, we all get those calls at 5 p.m. on a Friday. Like, oh, uh, I guess you're not there. Big, big thing to talk about. Talk to you Monday. And then my thoughts will be like totally paranoid at that point. And if I, if I, you know, what, what can you do? If I stop by the person's house or send them a, fo- a phone call or an email, I might actually work, you know, make the situation worse if there's a bad situation. Like, oh, why is this guy so paranoid? So, The thing is, people should learn to be like a cat. When a cat is sick, it just kind of sits down and hides and stays to itself until it feels better. It doesn't jump all around. Like, we need to learn how to do nothing when we're angry, when we're paranoid, when we're anxious, when we're tired. And here's a critical one, when we want to be liked. So if I, let's say you're in a work situation and you want your boss and your colleagues to like you, there's too much of an opportunity to basically kiss ass, if I can use the word, uh, you know, rather than just be calm, do your work and do it well. Instead, you do all these things that you shouldn't do just so you can be liked. You go to extra meetings, you um, offer, you know, you try to get people to laugh or try to please people and all of this stuff never works. And so people resist this. They feel like, oh, no, I have to do something. Something bad just happened. I have to solve the problem. But the reality is the best thing to do is to just do nothing and you'll be a thousand times more productive. Yes, James, that's a uh, good advice. And actually, I have kind of a take on this that ties into the interview, but I'd like to do it after the interview so our listeners can um, kind of digest it. And then get your thoughts on it. So uh, let's not let them wait anymore. Let's jump straight into the interview. Okay, well, so this is introducing Stephen Kotler, who wrote The Rise of the Superman. So we have with us Stephen Kotler, the author of The Rise of Superman, Decoding the Science of Ultimate Human Performance. Stephen, how's it going? Really good. Pleasure to be with you. Now, Stephen, you're not like flying with a cape, right? You're not Superman himself yet. I am not flying with a cape. I don't even have the boots. Excellent. Good. Well, what I really, you know, I I really wanted to have you on the show because not only am I a huge fan of this book, which discusses, you know, how uh, the average man can really rise beyond their limitations to use more of their brain, more of their body and so on with this concept you and others call flow. But I am also a huge fan. And I want to talk first about your last book, which was a bestseller, Abundance. And we get so much We get inundated in the media about how the world is ending, there's global warming, There's we're going to have overpopulation, everyone's going to starve, I don't know, there's going to be a a big volcano that kills everybody. And your book is a very kind of optimistic but but scientific, you know, contrarian view towards that. And maybe if you describe a little bit about abundance, and then I have some questions about that, and then we'll get into, uh, I really want to get into the rise of Superman after that. Sure. The idea at the heart of abundance is pretty straightforward. Um, 
It's that right now in the world today, there are four emerging forces that make it significantly possible to raise global global standards of living over the next 20 to 30 years. So to be clear, this is not techno-utopianism. I'm not, one of the forces is technological, but we're not saying technology alone is gonna get it done. What we're saying is that these four forces open up a possibility window um, for all of us, but it's still gonna take one of the largest cooperative efforts in history to pull it off. But you know, you say cooperative, and I sort of, view, when I read the book, it's almost like post-political, because, you know, you talk about things like, um, you know, the, the do-it-yourself projects that have, you know, put a, uh, put, put a spaceship into space that didn't involve the government at all. So it almost seems like uh, withdrawal of the government and the rise of these techno-philanthropists are going to contribute a lot towards this abundance, whether it's global warming or getting a man in space or, you know, medical changes and so on. Well, I think you nailed it. I mean, one of the four forces is the newfound power of the DIY innovator, right, the do-it-yourself innovator, and you absolutely nailed it. And one of the examples we used was Burt Rattan winning the X Prize, which was a $10 million prize for the first person who could do it. NASA and all the aerospace contractors in the world couldn't, which is put a man into space twice in two weeks. And, you know, that's kind of where it started. Then there's Craig Venter outperforming the Human Genome Project. They spent $300 billion, but took 15 years, didn't finish it. He steps in in a year for $300 million, gets it done. And it's gotten to the point that, you know, in 2008, MIT holds a synthetic biology competition where uh, we won't go into synthetic biology too much, but let's just say people are constructing, you know, things using DNA parts, right? like D- using DNA like Legos and building up from there. And when this competition first started, people were doing things like making glow-in-the-dark cats. They were taking genes out of jellyfish and putting them into cats, and it was neat. But in 2008... Oh, oh, the- oh can I take... I want to be glow-in-the-dark. Can I take one of those? <laughs> I think... I, I know who we should talk to. <laughs> All right, good. We'll talk after the after the show. <laughs> after the podcast. Um, the uh, 2008, the winning team was... Uh, a group of high school and college students from Slovenia who were working on used equipment. And mind you, Slovenia is not a country that has a large biopharmaceutical industry whatsoever. They came up with a cure for the most common form of ulcer. This is a major world-class biopharmaceutical uh, result being done by high school and college kids on used equipment for pennies on the dollar. And that's the level of what's now possible for individuals. So you're absolutely correct that we do see this as kind of a post-government solution. A lot of the problem is that the pace technology is accelerating with right now, governments can't keep up. They're, they, they're, too, they're way too slow. They're not built that way. I mean, you know, the, the framers did a great job with the Constitution, but one of the things it was designed for was slow change. They, were, they had seen all the revolutions in Europe, and they wanted to slow it down a little bit. So, you know, it's great on some That's level. very interesting. It's, it's bad on a lot of levels, especially when you're trying to keep pace with an exponential world. What are some of the things that you see people are are pessimistic about for America and for the world that you think they shouldn't be pessimistic about, that they should actually be optimistic about? Well, you know, what, what the story we always tell when people ask these questions is I, I have to start by talking about aluminum and tell you, I don't know what you know about the story of aluminum, but aluminum in the early 18th century, it's the rarest metal on earth. So it's more expensive than gold, it's more expensive than silver, it's more expensive than platinum. Napoleon throws a huge banquet for the King of Siam. All his men eat on silver utensils. Napoleon gets gold, King of Siam gets aluminum. The capstone to the Washington Monument made out of aluminum. That's how rare it is. The problem, the interesting point is, aluminum is not actually rare. It's 8% of the weight of the world, but it's always found bound up in oxides and silicates and we couldn't get at it. But between 1830 and 1870, the technology of electrolysis is invented. This uses electricity to liberate the ore from the rock. And suddenly, aluminum becomes one of the most ubiquitous products on Earth. We use it today with a throwaway mindset. And the point here is that technology is oftentimes a resource liberating mechanism. The sun is a phenomenal example. We know we've got an energy crisis. We know we have all these problems. But The sun gives us 5,000 times the amount of energy we use in a year every hour, 
right? Mm. It's 16, 16 terawatts of energy every hour hitting the Earth's surfaces. So again, it's not an issue of scarcity, it's accessibility. And here too, right, technology is making huge inroads. Solar is now advancing on exponential growth curves. It's not the only renewable that is, but solar is a great example. The cost is dropping 50% a year. Efficiency is going up 30% a year. These are amazing leaps forward. If you have abundant energy, suddenly a lot of the other problems we're talking about, food scarcity becomes a lot less of an issue. Abundant energy opens the door for technologies like vertical farming or in vitro meat. These are huge, huge technologies that you know well, can help us feed the masses and end hunger. So a well, lot what do you of think, what do you think of the criticism that people have on genetically modified foods, for instance? Well, I think, first of all, I think some of the criticisms are very right, um, and some are totally misguided. On a lot of levels, let me give you one example. I can take a bunch of seeds, I can put them in the bottom of a nuclear reactor, I can bombard them with radiation, mutate them, and then replant what's left, and that's an organic seed. Okay? That's classified that work. That doesn't sound very that good, That doesn't though. sound very organic, Right. That's, but literally, that falls under the rubric of what we consider organic these days. What people don't understand is that all this stuff has been going on forever. All G, GE technology um, allows us to do is be much, much more accurate with it. Now, there were issues. It was a bad idea that you know Monsanto should own all the seeds and own all the patents. Things like that were really scary. And there were problems there. But the truth of the matter is... The technology itself is very, very, very simple, and the upside is incredible. And the amount of people we're going to be able to feed using less and less land, and we want the, one of the biggest things we're up against is the biodiversity crisis. And the only way to stave that off is to repurpose land currently used for humans and give it back to animals and plants. And we have to do this, otherwise we're going to lose our ecosystem services, and that is one thing we cannot come back from as a, as a planet. But with abundant energy, with you know genetically modified food, and it's not, there are, by the way, natural ways of doing this that are, that are just as good. GE food is one technology we look at. There's a whole bunch of others, but it's a great one, and people should not dismiss it out of hand um, because they're scared, for th they're scared about things that aren't real. I'm not saying there aren't things to be scared about, but most of the things people are scared about when it comes to genetically modified food, they just don't know the science. Well, you just scared me about biodiversity. So how, how, how do we solve that? Like, what's the next step in solving that? That's actually where all this started for me. That was the problem I was working on. Um, and that was, you know, when Peter came to me uh, and to talk about abundance the first time, I, you know, he was looking at a lot of the technological stuff. I was looking at a lot of the environmental stuff. And so biodiversity is interesting, right? The best way, the best technologies we can do to, for biodiversity is quite simple, vertical farming. Vertical farming allows us to grow basically, you know, it, it means moving the farm from agricultural lands into repurposed skyscrapers and building our farms vertically inside of skyscrapers. The numbers vary, but it's we can essentially build 100% of our foodstuffs using 90% less water, 80% less land, and zero pesticides. Frees up massive amounts of land that can be repurposed. If you couple okay. this with in vitro meat, which is growing steak from stem cells, and this technology is here today, we're already doing it, right? And it's scaling up. The real problem is an energy problem. The bioreactors where we do it, they have to get massive to, to feed our population. And here, solar is, is, is the great advantage. But if cattle lands are amazing, cattle, there's enough water in, the av in, in an average adult steer to float a Navy destroyer. That's how much water gets used. So when you want to start talking about water wars, another problem people are really scared of, in vitro meat vertical farms really starts to solve these problems and they they start to fall down like dominoes because they're all nestled up to each other they all overlap so solve one problem and you end up solving a couple others and it sounds like there's a race of tipping points so either we're going to hit the tipping point of a bi biodiversity crisis or we're going to hit the tipping point of technology where all these problems are solved and there's kind of it's sort of like weird because the same people or the same groups politically are, uh, you know, against each other on these things. So the same people who might be against, let's say, in vitro meat are also, uh, you know, 
proponents of, you know, not ruining the environment. And yet you're saying these groups should yeah, work I'm together saying, better. I, yeah, you, it's, it's a phenomenal point you're making right now. And I've been saying this for years and we're doing some of this work at Singularity University. But the most leverage to me happens when you get the technologists and the environmentalists in the same room because they really have no idea what's going on. The technologist is a general rule, especially in Silicon Valley, where the people have a very strong libertarian bent, which has somehow come to mean anti-environment, and I don't understand that at all. Um, but nobody's talking to one another. And I, you know, I remember I was on the phone with one of the world's leading experts on water, and he was telling me that no matter what we did, you know, Saharan Africa was screwed. And I said, well, I understand what you're saying, but what about vertical farming? And he said, well, what's that? And I told him. He said, well, I don't know. I haven't figured that into my calculations. I said, what about in vitro meat? He said, well, what's that? And it goes on and on and on. This is not an unusual conversation. The two sides absolutely need to start talking to each other. Well, this brings up to an interesting point, and, and I'm going to quote your book for a second. So you say in the book, are you working on something that can change the world? Yes or no? The answer for 99.99999% of people is no. I think we need to be training people on how to change the world. So that's the quote. How do we switch? It's almost like at the heart of the educational system. How do we create an educational system that starts training people, training kids into adults that this is a way to think, that, that now we need to think about how to change the world? My argument there actually segues us into the rise of Superman, because the first thing I would say is we need to build flow um, into the heart of our educational system. That's not going to make let, sense Let's define anybody. flow. Okay. So flow is technically defined as an optimal state of consciousness where we feel our best and we perform our best. Most people have some familiarity with flow. Flow is those moments where... We get so sucked in that everything else seems to vanish. Concentration gets so intense that action and awareness start to merge. Your sense of self, your sense of self-consciousness disappear. Time passes strangely. Sometimes it speeds up and five hours will pass by in like five minutes. Sometimes it slows down and you get that freeze frame effect like in a car crash. And throughout, all aspects of performance go through the roof. So now, it, it seems like it could happen in many different types of environments. For instance... Uh, I've seen this happen among like computer programmers. They're so into their pr programming, you know, whatever code they're working on that they forget to eat, they forget to sleep, they go 24 straight hours. And, uh, I, I would call that flow. That's Your book, The Rise of correct. Superman, focuses on these extreme athletes who are in these phenomenal situations that they can't possibly fully trained for and it's flow that kind of bridges that gap between their training and what they actually accomplish. And so maybe you can describe some of the people who, who – some of these athletes that you covered uh, in the book. Let, let's, let's, let's start with your first point, which is coders, which is yes. I mean coding, is, coding and flow is so fundamental that um, you have – Microsoft, for example, has flow now woven through their corporate methodology. They're not the only one. If you read the Oracle Insight Developer series, which, series, which is what Oracle gives to all its new coders – Flow. There are chapters on flow. Timothy Lister uh, and his co-author in PeopleSoft, I can't remember his co-author's name, I'm sorry, um, they say flow is so important to coding that they should stop paying coders by hours worked and should start paying them by hours in flow. But again, not just coders, right? Business people, McKinsey did a 10-year study. They found top executives report being five times more productive in flow than out of flow. You've got to stop and think about that. That's a 500% increase in performance. It means you get to go to work on Monday in flow. You can take Tuesday through Friday off and get as much done as your steady state peers. Now, the reason I focus on today's action and adventure sport athletes in Rise of Superman is these athletes have become the best flow hackers in the history of the world. There's a lot of reasons for it, and we can talk about them in a second. But I use the athletes as case studies because if we can figure out exactly what they're doing to reliably reproduce this state, and we can then apply that knowledge across all domains in society, and that's a big and, deal. These and I, I think I just want to mention that's an important thing because – there's so much about extreme athletes and what's going on inside their you know, brains neurochemically, what's going inside their bodies. There, there's so much of this in your book. I really uh, – and, and I loved all those stories, but I, I – and I kept getting back to I want to be a Superman 
you know, I want to constantly be experiencing the state of flow, but I don't want to jump off a mountain or anything like that. Like, well, that so seems- the, good new- the good news there is we now know. So flow science is very old. It actually dates back about 150 years, kind of the birth of modern neuroscience, the birth of modern psychology. Both of these fields, some of the earliest work in these fields was done on flow states. And the work continued. We got really good at the psychology up through the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. We really mapped the psychology. But what happened then is we had a neuroscience revolution. And the technology has come so far so fast that we can now, as you pointed out, peer under the hood and see what's going on. And as a result, what we've learned is that there are 17 triggers for flow. And the good news is none of them none of them require anybody to risk their life. All of them can be applied in pretty much any situation. What sets the action of adventure sport athletes apart was literally the level of commitment. They built their lives around these flow triggers. A lot of it happened intuitively. The level of performance kept going up and up and up in these sports. So if these guys weren't in flow, guys and women, guys and gals weren't in flow, they were going to the hospital they were ending up dead. So they had to figure out how to get into this state by intuitive necessity. So they built their lives around these triggers. But anybody can do the same. And I would argue that especially anybody in a creative field, anybody who's doing anything even slightly vaguely creative for a living, should be absolutely doing the same. And I think most creatives who are good at it and have had long careers have done the same because there's creativity is also usually amplified in flow, critically important. And um, there's really no way to make a living as a creative if you're not really good at accessing these states. And and I totally agree with that. So I, I personally think that the kind of cubicle economy that America has survived on for the past hundred years is over. And that the only way to really survive over the next, call it 10, 20 years is to do what I call choosing yourself. And I really think a strong part of that is accessing this internal piece of yourself that contributes to flow and makes you a better person than you thought you could be. And you describe it though so accurately particularly with these extreme athletes. I, I'd like to hear some of the stories on the, on some of these athletes, but then um, we can kind of segue into what the listeners or what I can do personally to increase my flow or opportunities for flow. Well, let's talk about uh, one of my favorite stories in the book, which is a, a climber by the name of Dean Potter. And what I like about Dean is most people get into flow states and they last 20 minutes, an hour, an hour and a half tops. Dean is a free soloist, meaning he climbs without ropes, climbs without protection. It's a fall-you-die situation. And at the time that Dean started free soloing, besides the fact that most uh, a lot of people had lost their lives doing this, most people were free soloing kind of medium-sized routes. So intermediate routes that were 100 to, say, 300 feet tall. Dean decides to... He's done a bunch of those, and he's pushed into the expert level, but then he decides uh, to go down to Patagonia alone, and he starts free soloing some of the hardest mountains, mixed, mixed climbing, so it's both mountaineering, ice climbing, and rock climbing, and he's down there for days, so he's doing climbs that take him 10, 12 hours, and then he's not sleeping and hiking across glaciers at night, and then going up other things. So he, had fi- he has figured out how to extend deep, deep, deep flow states for two or three days at a time. That's astounding. Another thing, you know, just to just to kind of talk about what's happened in performance, I, I say if you look at action adventure sports as a data set, what you see over the past 25 years is nearly exponential growth in ultimate human performance. So that's performance when life or limb is on the line. Obviously, nothing like this has ever happened before. Sports performance and do you, is slow. Do you attribute that? Do you attribute that growth to uh, this sort of flow hacking that they kind of figured out that this was the the missing ingredient they needed, and so they specifically worked on it? Yeah, I absolutely. I mean, there uh, now, mind you, a lot of other things played a role. We got better at our physical training. Technology jumped forward, but even in the technology, the technology became the the, the internal technology, the flow technologies. And the external technologies, what they were doing, started to dovetail. So, for example, in mountain biking, in downhill mountain biking, they started to realize that they could build trails that had stunts on them, jumps or skinnies or or ladder drops or things things to do, and that if they 
built them in specific ways, they could drive people deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into flow as you r- ride down the hill. And we call these flow trails. They're, they're actually called flow trails. Um, mm. So the technology started to come together with kind of the, the, the internal mental hacking. But we've gotten really, really good at, at the mental stuff, especially in the action and adventure sports community. And you see kids today, you know, there are, there are 12, 13, 14 year old, 15 year old kids competing and, and meddling in the X games against, you know, 30 year old athletes, guys who have been at this for a really long time. And one of the reasons it's happening is because they're getting taught kind of the mental game very, very early. It's just kind of woven into the fabric of what they're learning. And so it's well, producing exceptional performance. Well, let's go. Let's go to the Dean Potter example. What took him from you know three hundred feet to you know the levels that that he did? So what? what how, how did he do it? So what you need to know about flow hacking? How do you trigger flow? All that stuff. At the, the the simplest thing to know is that flow follows focus, right? So anything that drives attention into the now drives flow. So. The at, I said there are 17 triggers. The athletes rely very heavily on three environmental triggers. These are external triggers, things found in the environment. And the first, of course, is high consequences. Obviously, consequences catch our attention. They drive our focus. But the important thing here is that the consequences themselves don't matter. What you're actually trying to get at is a neurobiological reaction underneath. You want the brain to release dopamine. But All besides the point. The point here is that, sure, a lot of people don't want to take physical chances, and I don't blame them. But you can also take emotional chances, social chances, intellectual risk, creative risk. All these things also trigger dopamine. So what does this mean in a work environment, for example? It means that companies where they have that Silicon Valley Valley fail forward kind of motto, really critically important because you need to give employees space to fail because they need to be able to take risks, even if they're just emotional risks or social risks or intellectual risks or creative risks. The other thing is it is totally individual. So Dean Potter has to solo, you know, huge thousand foot walls to drive himself into flow. But the shy guy needs only cross the room and talk to the pretty girl to get the same reaction. It's very individual. It's funny. I, I read a, a story somewhere else about a guy who was very shy, so he couldn't meet women. And so what his therapist told him to do was to go to a, the mall at a nearby town, and every single woman who came down the escalator, he had to ask her for coffee. And he just had to get – that was a way to force him to get over his shyness. And, and he he had to only come back to her when he asked a 100 women to coffee. Uh, and he could never get to – a hundred women because actually he found out once he started doing this and he overcame his shyness, everybody, you know, a lot of these women were saying yes. So he was spending more time drinking coffee than waiting at the bottom of the escalator. And this was kind of the, <laughs> the way he achieved, I guess, flow in his own way. That's pretty funny. Um, yeah. But it, it, you certainly you want to up the amount of risk. So what else did these athletes do? They put themselves in what we call rich environments. A rich environment is a fancy way of saying lots of novelty, lots of complexity, lots of unpredictability. Again, all three of these things, when we confront any of them, force the brain to release dopamine. And by the way, most of us have had this experience. If you've ever felt awe, where you've looked at a vast canyon and, and kind of the world seemed to pause for just a second, well, that's the time dilation, the slowing of time that comes in a deeper flow state. That's a taste of it for everybody. That's what happens when the brain encounters overwhelming complexity. It can't process it all consciously and has to kick things over to the subconscious, which is one of the main things that happens in the brain and flow. We transfer processing from the explicit system, which is our conscious mind, local and linear neurons clustered together, to our subconscious. And that's one of the things that happens when we encounter overwhelming complexity. Novelty is really, really, really important here as well. So you need to up the amount of novelty and complexity complexity and unpredictability in your environment if you want to trigger flow in the same way that these athletes are. And how, how do you do that? Like let's say a listener is – uh, sitting in his cubicle, hates his job, but, you know, is stuck paying the bills, you know, has a family to support. 
what how can he or she start thinking about changes in their lives or their routine to introduce some of this you know complexity to get in order to get flow well, okay so let's let's be clear first of all this is not self help we're talking about there this is nothing there's not there's no, nothing i can tell you here you can start applying monday morning and it's going to make huge changes in your life you have to really deeply commit. You have to sort of put flow central in your life. But what I always tell people who are stuck in a job where they're paying the bills and they they can't find things to do outside of work that generate lots of flow. First of all, flow outside of work will start to transfer into work. Why? Because all you're doing is training your brain to kick you into this state. So pick up a musical instrument, start painting watercolors, start riding a skateboard, do all, a lot of the things that we put away because we're adults, we put away the surfboard, we put away the skateboard because we're now grown and we're done with childish things. Now, it's time to reinvestigate those things. And the point here is this. As you pointed out earlier, what happens in a flow state is not only does it amplify performance in the moment, it gives you a higher perch. You can see possibilities that you couldn't see before. So if it feels like you're stuck in a dead-end job, and you can't really – You can. I, there are certainly ways to tweak it to create more flow, and we can talk about that a little bit. But I would start doing things outside of work. Don't come home and turn on the TV. That is not going to produce flow. Start doing things that actually are producing flow outside of work. It's going to open up new possibilities for, for you. So okay, so let's get let's get back to the extreme athletes because it sounds like like you said these people have moved into a, a realm of competition where it's life or death. Like you can't train for some of the things they do. Uh, I mean, you can to an extent. Like you mentioned with Dean Potter, he was uh, he got to expert level, but then you go on your own and you have to reach this this flow state. Uh, are you seeing this across all extreme sports now? Like are are they just beyond? That, that that is what the data is suggesting, and I, I'll give you I'll give you a really simple example. So, uh, in even in let's compare action adventure sports to regular bat and ball sports. Um, there's a Cal State Fullerton psychologist named Ken Revisa who did a study of bat and ball sports, track and field sports, and flow, and he found that flow states for these people were the highlights of the career. They showed up occasionally, but not all the time. Then they went to the Cheat Canyon, which is in West Virginia, and they asked every single kayaker from novices to experts who were paddling that, uh, that river in a 24-hour period, every single person they talked to had gotten into a flow state. So well, it does seem that the action adventure sport athletes have gotten much better at it, and they do seem to be hacking flow more than most. You know, and you brought up something in your book, uh, which I thought was a very interesting uh, ratio. It's not as if they're trying to do something that is impossible for them. They're trying to do something in many cases that's just 4% higher than they've done before. Cause so, so, the way, so their brains still think it's within the realm of possibility, but it yeah. allows them to kind of release the, the dopamine and uh, get into this flow state. Like what's – can you talk, discuss that ratio sure. a little bit? Sure. Um so one of the other uh, one of the uh, other flow triggers it's a psychological trigger, and it was discovered by Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi back in the seventies, and it's known as the challenge skills ratio. And what this really means is, if we talk about it emotionally, we pay the most attention not on but near the midpoint between boredom and anxiety. In other words. We pay the most attention when what we're doing, when the challenge of what we're doing slightly ex exceeds the skills we bring to bear. So you want to stretch but not snap. Now, Csikszentmihalyi and a Google mathematician did a back-of-the-envelope calculation. At, they were trying to figure out, can you put a number on that, that gradient? And they came up with 4%. And it's a loose figure. We at my organization, the Flow Genome Project, we took a harder look at that again, very preliminary, and we again saw that that was accurate and uh, seems to drive people into flow most. So what's key about 4%, um, just for your listeners before we get back to the athletes, is that for really high performers, you're going to blow by 4% without even noticing. You're going to try for something that's 15% harder or 20% harder because that's how high performers are wired. And the problem is when you go that hard, you are not giving yourself the amplification of the flow state. You're kind of denying yourself the flow state. You're actually going to neurobiologically, you can kick yourself over much closer to the fight or flight response. 
and you'll swamp your system with stress hormones and you won't be able to get into the flow state. For underachievers, right. 4% is tricky. Underachievers is a bad word. But for, for people who are less driven, 4% is tricky because 4% is the point at which you start to get seriously uncomfortable, right? So most people who don't have that drive, they get to 4%. They're uncomfortable, and they back off. So for really top achievers, they need to slow it down. Slow and steady wins the race. And for underachievers, you need to realize that that 4%, that feeling of uncomfortability, that's a good thing. That's a sign of progress and not a reason to turn around. Now, and what's... I, th I think that 4% really does translate to a large number of areas. Like you mentioned, you know, creative endeavors before, but what does the creator or the artist, what's the problem that they normally have? The problem they have is how can I say something that nobody has said before? So that doesn't mean how can I say something that's going to blow the world away? It's just how can I say one small thing or do one small work of art or creation or whatever that nobody has done before? And that reminds me a little bit of this 4% as opposed to by the way, 50%. I, I, as a writer, so how do I apply 4% to my life as a writer? What I've learned is that it means, A, I want to up the challenge level. So one of the things that I will do very often is if I'm stuck and I can't, an article isn't coming together or a book isn't coming together, whatever it is, I will start, I will start to switch my writing style. I'll find somebody who's writing I really love, who writes nothing like me, and I'll start copying their sentences. I won't steal their words, this isn't plagiarism, but I'll take their structure. Where do they put their commas? Where do they put their adjectives? Where do they put their colons, their verbs, et cetera, et cetera? And I will force myself to write in this unfamiliar style. I have also found that usually for me personally, um, allow, I have to push my vulnerability. I, I'm a big believer that you, you, you should tell the truth as much as you can in your writing, but how much of the truth you tell is the open question. And I always find that 4% um, is usually a little more than I'm normally comfortable diverge, divulging, but I do it anyways. So yeah. I will up the challenge level. I will try to be a little more honest, a little more vulnerable. I will do little tweaks like that. Often that's enough to drive me into flow. And then once everything kicks into gear, as I said, creativity is massively amplified. The brain's pattern recognition system um, it kicks into high gear and flow for a variety of neurobiological reasons. So we have an easier time linking new ideas together in unusual ways. And you get towards that brilliant breakthrough that you're talking about, right, this way. Well, and it's funny that you mentioned the, the writing thing. So my, my trick for that, for that flow or that 4% is I don't hit publish unless I'm somewhat afraid of what everyone will think of me once they read this. It's so great, that's my, yeah, that's my little stress, metric. that it's thing that happens. Metric. And to go back to your original point, how do these guys achieve the impossible? It's difficult to understand because when we see somebody riding a 50-foot wave, the brain – does very simple comparisons. It says, what would it be like for you to ride that 50-foot wave? And obviously, if you're not a big wave surfer, you go, well, it'd be insane. I would die. And you would thus decide it must be crazy. But what you forget is the guy riding that wave, there were weeks and months of three-foot waves, of four-foot waves, of five-foot waves, of six-foot waves, of 10-foot waves. And it's literally been 4% plus 4% plus 4% day after day, week after week, month after month. So one of the great examples, and I give this in the book, is Ian Walsh. Uh, a couple years ago, Ian Walsh hand paddled into Jaws. Now, Jaws is one of the biggest waves in the world, and for surfing a thousand-year-old sport from 400 AD to 1996, the biggest wave anybody's ever caught is 25 feet. Today, people are toe surfing into waves that are over 100 feet, so that gives you an idea of what's going on. But hand paddling was so difficult that Susan Casey, in her, in her best-selling book, The Wave, to trying to catch a wave over 25 feet by windmilling away on your stomach is like trying to catch the subway by crawling. Literally, physicists thought it was impossible. But Ian figured out a way to do it. He saw little windows in the wave where he could use the wave's momentum in ways that nobody had ever done before. And after a lot of time thinking about it and sort of training up for it in really interesting ways, you know, went out to Jaws and paddled and did this thing that for a thousand years – Everybody has said it was impossible. And if you ask him about it, if you say, Ian, what was that like, that crazy day where you literally shifted paradigms and a revolution occurred? He says it was like another day at the office. And that's the difference. <laughs> that the funny thing about these incredible, impossible feats is you talk to most of the guys about them afterwards, and that's what they're going to tell you. It was just another day in the office. I was pushing 
just as hard as I normally push, you know. And one of the great things about action adventure sports, by the way, with that four percent is the nature of the game keeps them in that sweet spot. So these sports are seasonal. They also are very heavily weather dependent. Good waves only show up occasionally. Big snowstorms that bring great powder only show up occasionally. So when the weather conditions are right, everybody wants to charge. They want to go that 4%. They don't want to go much farther because there's mortal consequences. So the actual nature of the activity drives them right into that sweet spot. It's funny, though, because, again, this reminds me of Abundance a little bit, your, your, the prior book. Like you mentioned Craig Venter and the Genome Sequencing Project. He must have been in a state of flow to basically, uh, again, he was already like a genius scientist and had done many things. But then to take this next step and say, OK, I don't have $300 billion, but I'm going to solve this project quicker and cheaper than anyone else has ever done. That must have been also pushing himself in that way where it was like another day at the office and yet he was achieving something no human had ever achieved before. We know, you know, just based on the research that at, at right now the current belief is that flow underpins kind of almost every gold medal or world championship that's ever been won. Un- underpins major, major scientific breakthroughs, as you just pointed out, and contributes to significant progress in the arts, right? Most great leaps forward have a flow state at the heart of them, because this is, this, this is just the state we get into when we're performing at that level, when we're coming up with wild, great, amazing, creative new ideas that allow us to shift paradigms. It's not 100%, but, you know, most of the time, flow is at the heart of that. You know, and you, and you say the book is not self-help, and I, and I get that. That's a different category and so on. But at the same time, there's a lot of the language you use in the book. Like, for instance, many of these extreme athletes say that uh, time, they had no sense of time or they had no sense of space. And you just referred to, you know, they felt this strong sense of the now, of the current moment. And this really is, you know, uh, resonates with many self-help books, like let's say an Eckhart Tolle who wrote The Power of Now, where he talks about how specifically using, you know, various techniques and methods of thinking, um, you can bring yourself into that state of presence, that state of now to kind of move away past emotional issues, psychological issues and so on to, so you could essentially perform better in everyday life. And, you know, I, I do see this parallel or this bridge between what you do or what you're talking about in The Rise of Superman and some of these personal improvement books like The Power of Now. Well, you're not wrong. The one thing that I'm hopefully doing, for example, let's talk about why does your sense of self disappear? Why does time dilate in a flow state? What we know now is that flow is caused, one of the things that causes flow is known as transient hypofrontality. It's a fancy word. Transient means temporary. Hypo is H-Y-P-O. It's the opposite of hyper. It means to slow down, to deactivate, to shut off. Frontality is short for the prefrontal cortex, the front part of your brain right behind your forehead that houses all of your higher cognitive function. So why does time get so weird in a flow state? Because time is actually calculated all over the prefrontal cortex. But when the brain becomes hypofrontal, parts of it start to shut down. It's actually an energy efficiency exchange. We are trading energy that we need for attention and focus and and awareness of of the moment. Uh, for all these other processes, but these parts of your prefrontal cortex are shutting off. So as parts of your prefrontal cortex shut down, you can no longer separate past from present from future. Why Why did we evolve the uh, prefrontal cortex? Well, it allows us to add massive amounts of complexity to situations, right? It's really, really, really useful in, there's a lot of thinking that requires kind of just linear deduction, really slow plotting. That's not what flow is great for. In that point, you want your prefrontal cortex fired up. Another, if you're making moral decisions on some levels, that part of your brain that governs morality tends to dampen down flow as well. So you might not want to be making those kinds of decisions in a flow state, right? So there are, there are times that it's useful and there are times that it's not. The reason I say it's not self-help is this. Self-help, as a general rule, is not dangerous. Flow, these are the five, there are five, dopamine is one example, but there are five of the most potent neurochemicals the brain can produce. They're produced during flow. All of them 
are incredibly, incredibly, incredibly addictive. So one of the things that's very common is people start generating more flow in their lives. They don't know what they're doing. It's happening accidentally. It's happening because they've gotten to a real good work project, just accidentally has these triggers. They don't know what it is. And suddenly, you know, they spend all this time running around feeling like Superman, and then suddenly they're out of it. And it can be extremely dark and depressing. And in fact, I would argue, for example, creatives have a very high suicide rate. And if you look under the hood at that, most of them will say it's because they've been getting into these states and now they're they're locked out of them. They can't tap their muse. They don't know how to get back there. Now, Rise of Superman hopefully provides ways around it. There are, you know, now we understand these 17 triggers. We understand uh, the flow cycle. Flow is a four-stage cycle. Most people used to think it was a binary, like a light switch. But if you understand the flow cycle, if you understand these triggers, you have a map to get back into the state. But it is still dangerous. You're playing with very, very, very powerful fundamental forces. And that once you start down this path, once you start generating more flow states in your life, it will take over. It will, your life will be radically better for it if you continue down this path. But I like to, you know, you brought up uh, Eckhart Tolle. I'm going to go back farther and go to Lao Tzu. What, uh, in, in spiritual terms, for lack of a better word, flow is what's known as a left-hand path. A right-hand path is safety, it's security, it's follow the rules, it's do what you're told. And these paths have a very long history of keeping us safe. They really work. Left-hand paths are mostly ecstatic, they're gray, there are questions everywhere. Lao Tzu said a left-hand path is best never begun, and once begun must absolutely be finished. And what we now know is by that absolutely be finished, what he's talking about is you're playing with very addictive neurochemistry. You're playing with fundamental motivations. People talk, motivation is so strong in flow that people talk about flow as the source code of intrinsic motivation, meaning once an activity starts producing flow, we will go very, very far out of our way to get more of it. That's addictive behavior. The difference between flow and other addictions is flow because it's based on challenges and skills and getting better. Uh, it leads forward. It's an addictive addiction that leads forward in the future, whereas most addictions lead backwards. But that doesn't mean it's less dangerous. And people need to know that when they kind of get involved in this. So I say it's not self-help because self-help is not is, – is, is, there, there isn't a dark side to a lot of that stuff. There can be a dark side to flow, and you need to know what you're doing. Well, you know, but it's interesting, though, because a, a fundamental characteristic of being human, I would say, is – a quest for achievement. We all want to feel like we're making some uh, improvement in the world or that we're achieving something. Uh, you know, this and human connection are kind of the two fundamental factors of being human. And what's what you're saying, though, is is that to achieve, to have human achievement or to make your contribution in the world now, you basically need to know how to tap into this sense of flow. So perhaps there's ways to do it, again, without, uh, and you refer to this, but with, without jumping off a mountain, but, you know, tapping into it skillfully using these triggers. Absolutely. And I, you know, I, and you're seeing it, you know, just to, just to totally change context for a second, you're seeing it more and more. I think one of the things that I've, that I've said a lot is if you look at Silicon Valley, the coolest revolution coming out of Silicon Valley, it's not happening in technology. It's happening in people management. And what I mean by that is companies like Google, companies like Facebook, they are already using a lot of flow hacking techniques. They may not look this way. Facebook, for example, has no meeting with Wednesdays. Why is this? Because Facebook is built on coders. Coders king at Facebook, and coders need long periods of uninterrupted con concentration to get into flow. You're seeing it across the boards in some of these better, edgier companies. So the interesting thing here is, first of all, some of these companies – you know, who I'm sure your listeners are competing with one way or another, they're already using these techniques. If you think about what I said earlier, that people are 500% more productive in flow, and you're already, you know, and they're starting to, and these companies are starting to apply these techniques, they're only going to start getting better at it. So you're starting to compete with people already who are using flow hacking techniques. So I, I don't think, you know, I think you do want to start moving in this direction. I think everybody's going to have to start moving in this direction. Um, but you just want to do it carefully and know what you're doing. Well, and now here's a naive question, but is there kind of a chemical way to do it? Can I get just injected with the right amounts of do dopamine and these other neurochemicals and suddenly I'm in flow? Well, it's tricky. 
there are uh, there are not chemical ways. But earlier we talked about transient hypofrontality. So uh, the military has been doing studies with flow um, where they've been using transcranial magnetic stimulation. Basically, they're shooting a big magnetic pulse into the front of the brain, and they're disabling the prefrontal cortex, and it's driving people into flow. There's a lot of neurofeedback techniques that will help you train your brain to get into the alpha theta wave borderline, which is kind of the baseline signature of flow. So there are technologies that are coming online that are making this easier. Um, as far as the pill form, first of all, we're, the neurochemistry of, of this research is the most recent stuff to go on. We still don't have a very good way of measuring neurochemicals in the brain. We do know, for example, L-DOPA is a drug they give to Parkinson patients, which increases the amount of dopamine in the brain. One of the things that dopamine does is it smooths over muscle reaction times. So for athletes, they want this because they can react quicker when there's more dopamine in the system. So there are, you know, there are drugs out there that tweak one or two of these neurochemicals, but we have no idea how to release all five at once. I've talked to a lot of people in the kind of life extension space who are really interested in are there kind of precursor chemicals that they could, you know, that over the counter things that they could be taking right now that up the amounts of these neurochemicals in the brain? The answer is yes, but not yet. We're not well, there yet. Why did you talk to the life extension guys? Is there evidence that the greater you are, you are in these states of flow, the longer you are healthy and live and, and so on? Well, uh, no, I, t- I uh, no, but uh, okay, so. Two answers. The first answer is um, this was actually what got me into flow research early on. I was very, very ill. I spent three years in bed uh, with Lyme disease, and nobody knew what to do with me. I, they pulled me off meds. There was nothing else they could do. And throughout, inadvertently, I ended up surfing myself back to health. And while surf, while these, while I was going surfing, um, I was having these outrageously wild flow states. And It was the only thing I was doing different. And when it was all said and done, and I went from like literally 10% functionality, I was literally like lucid and able to think and, you know, use my brain and function and walk across the room 10% of the day to like 80% 80 functionality uh, in about six months. I wanted to know what the hell was going on because it was bizarre. It didn't make any sense to me. I was a science guy and surfing is not known as a cure for chronic autoimmune conditions. So my original quest was what the hell is going on and what I discovered. And this is, by the way, this is Herb Benson's work at Harvard. Um, all of the neurochemicals that show up and flow massively boost the immune system. And more importantly, I think they reset the nervous system. They calm the nervous system back down towards zero. So they really, really, really decrease stress. So to answer your question, yes, it does appear that there are some links between flow and longevity, but they're very, 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 very kind of newly discovered, and we have no idea really what they are, and there's so much more work to be done. The reason I was talking to the life extension guys is when it comes to hormones and hormone replacement therapy and you know precursors to neurochemicals and those stuff, that's their area. That's a lot of the work, a lot of the work that uh, some of the life extension movement has done is in there. So they, they kind of have that, that background in endocrinology so they can have those conversations. It's interesting. I didn't know that about you and the Lyme disease, but I have, um, I know two people, one of them, my wife, who was, uh, ill with Lyme disease at one point. And both of these people, including my wife, uh, had similar experiences as you. They, they, the meds were not helping. It was going on forever. All the doctors wanted to do was keep on upping the dosage of antibiotics, which was literally killing these people. And it was only by finding their own particular, what I will call states of flow, they were able to kind of overcome the Lyme disease. So that's an, an interesting area to, to look into because Lyme is such a weird disease. Like it, it pops up in your, in your body in so many different ways. Yeah, I, and I, to me, I think flow is so critical there because Lyme, autoimmune conditions in general, it means your nervous system is going crazy, right? That's really what's going on. So resetting the nervous system, calming it down kind of violently with flow states is um, kind of radically positive therapy, at least in my experience. I'm, I'm always hesitant with, with diseases and medical advice. I never I never give it, and I, you know, uh Every, I think everybody's disease is individual and everybody's cure is individual. Um, that was what I discovered for myself, and I think that's what most people end up discovering. It sounds like that's what your wife discovered. But, you know, we even Herbert Benson at Harvard, who did this work, said, wow, it does appear that, you know, a certain percentage of cases of quote unquote spontaneous healing may have flow states kind of as their root cause. 
Yeah, for her, there was a lot of yoga involved and acupuncture and so on, like more natural um, healing techniques that, again, push the body to the limits. Uh, and, you know, or, or maybe it's that, that consistent every day, 4%, you know, trying to improve at something uh, that, that really helped her and helped this other guy as well that I know of. Well, I also think, you know, we know from, you know, countless studies that the happiest people on earth, the people who rate the highest for life satisfaction, are the people who have the most flow in their lives. And we know this from some of the largest psychological studies ever conducted. This is very, very, very well established. I don't know what your wife's situation was like, but after three years in bed, I was suicidal. I was miserable. I hadn't had a good day in three years. So that first day, I mean, they, and when I tell you that people had to carry me to the ocean to take me surfing, they had to walk me out to the break, and it was like two-foot waves that day. But that first day, like, I was out there 30 seconds, wave came, and muscle memory took over, and I spun my board around, and I paddled twice, and I popped up, and I popped up into this other dimension. But the biggest thing about the whole thing was I felt great. For the first time in three years, I didn't just feel okay. I felt amazing. All the pain load that I'd been carrying in my body that didn't allow me to walk was gone. Psychologically, I was clear-headed. I could think, and I was happy. That alone, just to just to have the memory of joy kind of come back to you, and you're like, oh, yeah, it is fun here. I do want to live. That to me was a huge advantage because if you get if you lose sight of the reason you want to live, it's pretty hard to come back from that. You know that that's great. So that led to ultimately you writing this book, The Rise of Superman: Decoding the Science of Ultimate Human Performance. I mean, I have to tell you, I read the book. It's great. I highly recommend it. I have one last question for you. Um, you your last book before this, again, Abundance, was New York Times bestseller. With this one. Why did you go the self-publishing route, you know, through Amazon? And again, I've, I've well, published, I, it's, it's I've, not I just want to mention, I've published 10 books myself. I've done half traditional publishers, half self-published. I love self-publishing and I'd love to get your uh, take on it. I didn't actually go self-publishing. Amazon, uh, a couple years ago, established an actual hardback imprint, right? So they opened up a real legit uh, publishing arm and they, um, I, I went that route basically because I, I just – there was a lot of things we wanted. To, flow is a very difficult topic. I knew we were going to have to make the five videos that we made leading up to Rise. I knew I was going to need a publisher who would back me on that, who had deep pockets, who was willing to do really radical stuff because it had to – We it took a while. We had to like – this is a – Difficult topic for people. There's a lot of information. You know, there's a, there's, there's sort of a bias against action sports. So first of all, I had to convince the general public that there was something to learn from these athletes. We had to socialize people to the term flow long before the book came out. So Amazon gave me a ton of advantages. There were obviously some disadvantages, but they gave me a ton of advantages and they've been an amazing partner all the way through. They've been a blast to work with. Well, uh, thanks so much again, Stephen, for, for coming on the show. I've really been learning from, from your books, uh, and I really appreciate it. So, again, um, the book is called The Rise of Superman, Decoding the Science of Ultimate Human Performance. I love that name, by the way, too, The Rise of Superman. How did you come up with that? I, it was, uh, in a flow state. It, we were, I was, uh, this, this started out as a Playboy article and he called it, I think they called it superhuman and I was just huh. playing around. I don't, I don't actually know where it came from. Um, but I was, I was kind of trying to describe what it, what was going on in the book to a friend of mine and I, the word rise popped out of my mouth and that was, that was the connection. Once I, you know, that's where it came from, but it was one of, you know, I have no idea in all honesty. It's great because then the cover design, you have this red and this like flashy blue. It, it feels like Superman, like the well, comic the other, book. I mean, it just, the other thing it's, also it's great. was, you know, the, I, I mean Superman in the kind of like, you know, there's a tradition that goes all the way back to the Greeks of like, I mean, the first word we had for this was hyperanthros, which means, unfortunately, uh, it doesn't mean faster man, which I thought it meant, but it means more than man. And then, you know, George Bernard Shaw, Nietzsche, 
th- these terms have been around, and I, I wanted a term, you know, I wanted this, I like the superhero reference, but really I was talking about kind of this overarching desire that you pointed out earlier. We we really want to know what's possible for ourselves. We really want to push into these outer limits. We really want to know, can we fly? And those were all things that were referenced in the title. Well, that's great. Again, once again, Stephen Collar, thanks for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. And uh, good luck with the with this book and the success of it. Thank you so much, James. It was super fun. All right, James. So what was your biggest takeaway from the interview? I had one, but I'd like to get yours first. Well, I th- A, I think it's fascinating that um, what, what he talks about, how the brain sort of gives up control in these life or death situations and sort of outsources to other parts of the brain, um, you know, techniques and methods so that you can basically become more than human in these moments of life or death situations. But I want to stress this is not, he uses extreme athletes as an example, but I really feel like for myself and maybe many of the listeners feel this too. I've definitely hit these flow situations in my own versions of extreme a- athletics. So my own version, I've never been a skateboarder or a mountain climber or a skier or whatever, but my own version is I've been broke and scared and lonely. And sometimes it feels like at that moment, life or death. And I need to act because I have, might have a family to support or I might, you know, be considering even horrible things in my depression. So I have to act right now and I have to really connect to parts of myself that are going to give myself flow and it's life or death. And you know what? I do have, you know, ways to get into this flow situation. You kind of, you know, when you hit bottom, you know, you have to really recognize it's your best thinking that got you here. Like, all your life brought you to this point where you're hitting bottom. And so now you have to do something that your brain has never done before because otherwise you wouldn't have hit bottom. You have to take a step back and you have to make sure, and I always say this, you have to make sure you're physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually working towards health every single moment you can. Even if even if everything in your body is against that, like you're hitting bottom and you're feeling just stressed and anxious and ugh. So for me, Going broke multiple times and coming back from that, that was my version of like, I had to hit flow or I wasn't going to survive and survive. I did. Yeah. And flow is uh, interesting to me because um, I've got a friend of mine who uh, got his master's in psychology and he was telling me about this probably about four years ago. So I did some, you know, studying on the uh, subject and for him in, and it was also for um, Cutler, it was surfing, right? That's kind of their state of flow. It's where time stands still. It's where you're kind of in this absolute state of uh, not not an out of body experience, but you're able to push yourself to the limits, but still stay very relaxed. And uh, for me, it was when I was traveling overseas in Thailand and Singapore recently. I had this like three week state of flow that I couldn't really describe. And uh, a lot of that was just kind of getting out of my comfort zone, being in a foreign land, but also just really stopping and appreciating things. And time did seem very warped to me, Um, but it's a tough deal because it's something that I can't figure out how to get myself into and force it or to create that environment yet, but I continually try. And I'm sure you also experience it, James, like when, you, you know, you've written several books and in order to get into, um, you know, a really good rhythm, you have to have kind of had that flow state. Wouldn't you agree that that's part of the, the writing process to you? Absolutely, because you could sit down and nothing can show up uh, in your head, which means nothing's going to type out of your fingers. And, you know, I, I have a practice of writing every day. Other people have other practices of what they do every day. So I really, you know, need to, you know, get the thoughts and words flowing. And again, it's like I said earlier, if you're angry or anxious or paranoid, you know, sometimes it's best to do nothing and just relax. And, you know, again, it's, you know, Stephen mentions kind of a lot of these people in flow and you just mentioned you, you, you lose track of time and space, you know, sort of this concept of being in the now, like for most people, even when they're really upset or they're really anxious or they're really scared, it's it's sort of in the head that this is happening and it's kind of in the decision-making part of the head. But if you really take a step back, like right now, oh, the sun is out, I could take a deep breath, I'm, I'm feeling healthy, I could take a walk around the block and, and relax and life could be better for me. Um, 
you know, sometimes getting into that state of now is very important to kind of wipe away all the things that are, are trying to bring you down or kill you or whatever. But, you know, also you mentioned like when you were traveling, you would often feel this state. That's because there's so many new experiences. It's like taking this weird drug. Like suddenly you're in the human world, but nobody is speaking your language and nothing and things look similar, but not exactly like how you're used to. So that also puts you in this sudden state of alertness where you have to be, you know, aware of everything around you. And I think it's just that thing of get stop being in the future or the past like where your regrets live or where your fears live they th- your regrets always live in the past and the fears always live in the future but right now really nothing is there and when you kind of open the door to allow the moment to just happen as it is without pressure from all the past and the future you're going to find at least part of that state of flow you're going to be in a better state than you were if you're always kind of surfing the future or surfing the uh, uh, the past. Now, I'll, I'll give you one statistic, which is kind of related to this. I think kids often are more likely to be in this state of flow than adults. And there's an interesting statistic. Guess how many times a kid laughs on an average day? The average kid laughing on the average day. How many times do you think that happens? Oh, man, I'm going to say... Um... No, 273 times. Oh, my God. You're, you're, you're really accurate, actually. It's about 300 times the nice. average kid laughs on the average day. Guess how many times uh, the average adult laughs during the average day? I'm going to say 24. Not as accurate, but close. Five. Five? So, and, and, you know, there's some... Five. There's some bridge between childhood and adulthood that takes 295 laughs a day out of our schedule. And so, but this is really important. It's not just a matter of like, oh, well, I'm too busy. I, I, I didn't have time to laugh or find things that are funny. This is actually really important for, for health and for, I think, reaching these superior psychological states because you, you, we've all experienced the phenomenon of runner's high when you've been running a long time and then suddenly your body and your brain kick into this really sort of flush state of, of highness. And laughter is often called inner jogging because the same chemicals are released when you laugh as when you have runner's high. It's, uh, these endorphins kick in. And, uh, you know, an endorphin is short for endogenous morphine. So, uh, what a great thing to be able to take heroin uh, for uh, that your body makes because you'll never get addicted to it. It's totally natural. And the way one of the ways you get into that state is by finding ways to laugh during the day. And it's really hard when you're sad or depressed or whatever, but it's really worth trying. Um, and, you know, it's been shown to, you know, cure terminal illnesses. It's been shown to make you more productive. And I think this is one of the ways, you know, you can you can. Get your body ready. You don't have to force your body into flow, but you can get your body ready so that when you need flow, it's there. And, and you know, laughter, exercise, sleeping well, um, all of these things help to, to keeping your body uh, ready for that state. Yeah, and it ties into um, the interview we did uh, last week where, you know, get out and play. Play like a little kid, right? Uh, you know, grab some baseball gloves. Go throw the ball. Go kind of channel into your, your inner child and uh, – Get back to laughing, man. If you're hanging out with a bunch of people, your friends, your family or whoever, and they're not challenging you to laugh or they're not fun, I suggest finding new people in your life. That's totally true. And, you know, it's, it's great. Like one thing I do and I, I do this uh, with with Claudia, my wife, we try to find like one or two things a day we can take photos of that will make us laugh. And, you know. Sounds stupid and it is stupid, but it keeps us aware of different situations we can maybe, you know, put ourselves in where, oh, let's take a photo of this or let's take a little video of this. And, you know, it's just fun. Not everything in life has to be so serious. You know, money will never will never make you really feel better. All of these other things like laughter or exercise, this will make you feel better. Money and abundance in general becomes a side effect of achievement and health and, you know, all of these various techniques that we've been talking about all through this podcast, you know, for the past few months, money is just a side effect of that sense of play, that sense of being a child, that sense of health and so on. 
Yeah, that's great. All right, James. Well, um, I still want to encourage uh, all of our listeners, as always, to write to us, james at stansberryradio.com, james at stansberryradio.com. I know tomorrow we're going to be recording more Ask Altature segments, which are basically a 10 minute. I pull out one question. You don't know what it is. Comes from your Q&A on your Twitter. It comes from potentially your blog. It comes from James at stansberryradio.com. And uh, I put you on the hot seat and looking yeah. forward to doing that. I, I, I have fun with those. You know, every Thursday I do a Q&A on Twitter. Uh, so I get lots of questions from that, too. And uh, it's it's fun. And we, we are planning on turning that into a, a daily podcast alongside of this weekly podcast. All right, James. Well, that's all the time we have for this week. Hope everybody enjoyed it. And um, any parting thoughts for the listeners? You know, go outside and play catch. It's it's springtime. Love it. All right, James. Talk to you soon. Thanks, Aaron. Bye-bye. Stansberry Radio is a purely public broadcast and is not intended to be personalized financial advice for any individual specific situation. Each individual's financial situation is unique and Stansberry Radio should not be relied upon and or considered as personalized advice. Stansberry Radio is not licensed to render personalized advice and should be considered simply the public opinions of Stansberry Radio and its guests. Recommendations on specific financial securities are not intended to address any listener's particular financial situation. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry, and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power, so how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance.